Hello, Grace Lutheran Church of Wenatchee. Welcome to worship on this Sunday, September 13th, 2020. It's been a difficult week. Smoke fills the air. It is difficult to see the mountains and foothills in our Columbia River Valley. And we know that this past week, wildfires have raged across the state of Washington and the entire West Coast uprooting people from their homes, forcing them to evacuate, putting so many people in danger. Lives have been lost, towns have been destroyed. So much nature, woodlands, has been destroyed. So as we go into worship, we lift up in prayer those who have been forced to evacuate, and we hope that they find shelter and aid, and that their lives are able to return to a sense of normalcy as soon as possible. We also lift up our creation in prayer and pray for its healing and that God may guide us to be better stewards of this home that we have. This also is a service of Holy Communion. And so I invite you to prepare bread and wine or suitable alternatives at this time if you would like to participate. And then finally, I'd like to offer the either announcement or reminder that this afternoon, Grace will be hosting a drive through food drive as part of the God's Work, Our Hands project that we do with the entire Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. So from 1 to 3 p.m., we will be kind of hosting a bit of a drive through food drive where you can drive in into the parking lot, drop off food from your car, completely social distanced, and then volunteers will bring it to a pantry that we're setting up here that will serve the needs of the community. Uh, so be sure to bring a mask, be sure to bring hand sanitizer just to make sure you stay safe, but I hope that you'll stop by and donate whatever you can. You can find a list of suggested donations uh, on the Facebook page for the events, but I'll also post that list to the YouTube uh, page as well as the Zoom chat uh, that goes on during worship. So with that, let us now turn our hearts and minds toward God and prepare to worship together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all of our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We will now sing our gathering hymn, ELW number 834, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts of love, hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Today's reading from Psalms comes from Psalm 103, verses 8 to 13. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear them. A reading from Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, 
Not seven times, but, I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment was to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm Bergen Eikhoff. I'm the new intern pastor here. Eventually I'll stop introducing myself. Just want to make sure you know who I am. Uh, and to begin with this sermon, I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge two things. The first is that the term slave appears often in Jesus' parable today. And because the term slave carries a lot of trauma and pain for a great many people, I shall be using the term sermon, or servant for the rest of the sermon. The second thing to mention is that I, like many people in the world, experience an anxiety disorder. This is not some great secret, it doesn't take a lot of courage for me to share this, um, because three years ago my sister helped me begin seeing a therapist, and I've been able to develop uh, some really good strategies that have helped me organize my thoughts and reclaim my self-worth. Uh, but two years ago, I was challenged with perhaps the first really difficult confrontation in my work towards self-compassion. I felt like I had failed my parents. My parents, you see, supported me through so many things, through all my musical and theater endeavors in high school. They helped me pay for my preferred college, which was really expensive. And they helped me study, or they supported me as I studied piano at this college and also throughout my childhood. They let me live with them after college while I worked as a youth minister. And while they had done so much to support me, I felt like I hadn't lived up to their hopes for me. I felt like I hadn't succeeded enough in life, uh, done anything worthy of note, hadn't gotten married yet, and didn't always feel as, I ha or as happy as I thought I should, certainly as I thought they wanted me to be. So to tell them about this, I did what most English majors would do, and I wrote a poem. Uh, and I cautiously shared it with them, expecting that my confession would only make them feel hurt and unappreciated. But after they read it, all they had to offer me was love and compassion. They promised that they loved me for who I am, not what I produced, told me that I didn't owe them anything, and they asked how they could better show love to me so that I might believe them. Though they may not have realized it at the time, they were forgiving me of the many impossible debts that I thought I owed to them. And once they did, it felt nothing short of liberating. 
And this liberating for feeling of forgiveness is exactly what I believe Jesus hopes to show Peter. After this mouthpiece of the disciples hesitantly asks his Messiah, how many times am I supposed to forgive someone? Hiding the true question behind his breath, how many times can I expect to be forgiven? Reading the fear in Peter's voice, Jesus takes the already generous suggestion of seven times to forgive someone who's wronged you, and then skyrockets it up to 77 times that you're supposed to forgive someone who wrongs you. And then Jesus reinforces this promise of unquantifiable love by telling of a servant who owes a king 10,000 talents. Now the numbers of this passage are really essential because the world of Jesus, like our own, is driven by wealth and money. One talent you see was worth roughly 6,000 denarii, a currency I'm sure you all know about now. Uh, 6,000 denarii was already a ton of money, but then the servant owes 10,000 talents, and that's somewhere equivalent to the GDP of a small country, or maybe even a large country too, we're not entirely positive. Uh, denarii would be approximately a worth of you know, a day's labor, let's say, by a common laborer. So anyway, this servant knows that he has a debt that he will never be able to repay, but then when he sees that his wife and his children and his possessions will all be sold along with him in consequence for his debt, he falls upon the ground begging the king for an ounce of mercy just to give him the time that he needs to maybe find some way to pay everything, find some kind of magical solution. But the king, observing that this servant clearly believes that his debt is worth more than who he is, decides to forgive the servants of everything that he owes. No strings attached, no conditions, just limitless forgiveness. And can you imagine what the servant must have felt like? Would he even been, have been able to comprehend the king's decision? He owed an impossibly huge debt and yet was forgiven at no cost, liberated just because the king like God, believes now and always that who we are is so much more important than what we owe. And so we are infinitely forgiven. But then Jesus does that annoying thing where he keeps on talking. And our freshly forgiven protagonist goes out to find a fellow servant who owes him 100 denarii which is significant, but so much smaller than his former debt. It's, it's the difference between how difficult it is to count to seven versus how difficult it is to count to 77 or maybe 7,000. It's laughable to think that our forgiven servant would care about something so insignificant, but he does care a lot because we humans are so often more concerned with what we are owed than extending forgiveness to the people in our lives who need it most. And the forgiven servant becomes the unforgiving servant when he responds to the exact same plea that he gave to the king just a few minutes ago. Have mercy on me, and I will pay you. With violent retribution, and with torture, until this second servant is able to repay. He who should have recognized the importance of forgiveness, he who knows how liberating limitless forgiveness can be, refuses to share it because he cares more about what he believes he is owed than the essential worth of another human being. And then we get the devastating consequence when other servants witness the act of cruelty, report the unforgiving servant to the forgiving king, and the servant is punished for neglecting to share the limitless forgiveness that he was given. The forgiven hero has become an unforgiving villain. The message of God's limitless forgiveness for us is also a message of how difficult we humans find it to forgive one another's debts. Forgiveness carries the power to create the reign of God on earth when we choose to make forgiveness known through our actions and our words. But it 
it also carries the power to create pain and suffering when we withhold forgiveness from those who need it. And seeing those extreme stakes makes Peter's initial question make all the more sense because how can we practice this limitless forgiveness in a world where people hurt us so often or hurt the ones we love? How do we respond with limitless forgiveness? Fortunately, we have an example of the forgiveness that Jesus expects from us in the character of Joseph. See, Joseph's brothers have abused him from a young age because his father favored him. They threw him in a pit. They left him to die before deciding instead to sell him into slavery. Then Joseph eventually rises to become the second in command of Egypt. Then his brothers come to him for help surviving a famine that plagues their homeland. But now their father has died, and they're convinced that the debt they owe to Joseph is so impossibly high that they could never repay it and that he will surely take his revenge, as is his due. But when confronted with his brother's desperation, Joseph asks this incredible question. Am I in the place of God? Because on one hand, Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant shows us that the answer to this question is no. For we are all dependent on the life-giving, liberating forgiveness of God. But on the other hand, Jesus' parable shows us that whenever we have the opportunity to forgive debts, we are in the place of God. For we can make forgiveness a reality by liberating people from what makes them feel unworthy by taking care of their needs. And so Joseph realizes that his brother's need for forgiveness, security, support, and affirmation puts him in the place of God gives him the responsibility not only to forgive them, but to make that forgiveness known and real to them. And so he forgives them not only with words, but with tears, with embraces, and a promise to take care of their needs and their children's needs so that they may believe in the forgiveness that he offers. And remember that they are all beloved children of God, recipients of limitless forgiveness. That is the forgiveness Jesus calls us to practice, the forgiveness of impossible debts in words and in actions that liberate people from their fears of unworthiness so they may know that they are loved by the God of limitless forgiveness. For Jesus shows us that we are here to make God's forgiveness felt, to forgive the debts of others so that they know that God has forgiven them. For it is God's work that frees us, but it is our hands, our bodies, our words, and our actions that make forgiveness a reality in this world. And what a task that is to be set before us. For this world is a world of debts, this world is a world that tells us that we are what we owe, that tells us that we do not live for the Lord. We live to pay the bills, to acquire wealth, to gain power, to acquire luxury, status, privilege. And that love and acceptance cannot be ours unless we can afford them. And people and the very world itself are crying out in pain because of the debts that we are expected to carry and repay but can never repay. People who bear the burdens of centuries of oppression are crying out for justice and reform. People across the country who have been exploited by our economic system are crying out for relief. People are being forced out of living spaces because we cannot imagine how to reconfigure our systems of debt and repayments. People who are suffering from abuse and neglect are crying out for people to stand with them, to help them, give them assistance, and help them rewrite the world to become more equitable, more loving. 
This week we have watched the earth itself, God's beautiful creation, catch fire and pay for humanity's neglect to take care of our natural resources, to reduce carbon emissions, and many people have been uprooted from their homes, forced to find shelter elsewhere, and now cry out for aid as homes and lands have been lost. How can we expect people suffering from so much debt to believe that they are loved by the God of limitless forgiveness? And how can we expect to be ready, how can we expect them to be ready to forgive? People of grace, we must realize that we are in the place of God, possessing the power to make forgiveness a reality and reshape the way that the world works. We are like Peter, doubtful that our world could actually function on Jesus' promise of limitless forgiveness, but called nonetheless to practice a forgiveness that shows all of God's people that they are forgiven by forgiving their debts, by taking care of one another's needs. It's an impossible task, isn't it? Jesus' parables really have a way of asking the near impossible of us. They give us amazing, life-changing news before asking us to be the love of Christ to one another. So when confronting the matter of forgiveness, let us begin by remembering that we are loved by a God whose love is so limitless that all of our debts, our sins, or our offenses have been forgiven before we even ask. Because God became human in the form of Jesus Christ to live among us, teach us, die for us, and rise for us. Then, fueled by Christ's love and sacrifice, we can take that gift of forgiveness and consider where we can offer it to others by relieving the burden of debts and needs for an overburdened world. We can consider how we as individuals and as a church can be Christ for our community, can use our resources and platforms to begin forgiving the debts that we see in the world where there are no shortage of debts in this world. I certainly have a few that are on my mind right now. Student and housing debts have been incredibly difficult burdens for a number of my peers, especially people of color. The wildfires this week remind me how much we need to help one another survive and how much we need to change the way that we treat our planets. But I would like to hear from you, Grace. I'm willing to guess that there are debts that you have seen in this world, that you believe could be forgiven, fulfilled, or resolved. And I would like to invite you to make those known. I have created a Google form that I'll post in this Facebook post and also, or for the video, and then I'll also put it in the YouTube description or the Zoom chat, wherever you're watching this service today. All it does is ask you to anonymously suggest a debt that the Grace community could work together to fulfill. Valerie Kaur, a person of the Sikh faith who leads the Revolutionary Love Project, claims that forgiveness is freedom from hate. Perhaps more than any other debt in the world right now, hate holds back the knowledge that we are loved by God. So people of grace, let us remember that we live because of God and we live for God. And because we are limitlessly forgiven by God, we are in the place of God. Call to practice limitless forgiveness by freeing people from debts and freeing people and ourselves from hate. Through that practice of forgiveness, where we make it manifest in our words and our actions, because Jesus Christ has set us free with limitless forgiveness. Amen. We will now sing our hymn of the day, ELW number 592, Just As I Am Without One Plea.
with the whole Christian church on earth, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith, Lord God, through all faith formation programs and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries, especially this day we give thanks for Pastor Wayne Shipman, former intern here in our congregation, who was ordained yesterday. Bless his call as he moves to the communities of Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Pocatello, Idaho, and Emmanuel Lutheran Church, Blackfoot, Idaho. Bless his ministry and the ministry of those congregations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom as our nation prepares for elections this fall. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless our Little Essentials Food Pantry effort that we are uh, beginning here on our property of grace. Help our neighbors to have enough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
all these things and whatever else we see you see that we need we entrust to your mercy through christ our lord amen the peace of christ be with you always Take this time to share a sign of God's peace with those near you and those distant. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table that we may come to the help of all in need through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Dear friends in Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and then he gave it for them all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. now sing our sending hymn, ELW hymn number 543, Go My Children With My Blessing.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.